thanks a lot, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, okay, so this was um, work done in collaboration with Martin Plenio and, and Julian Pedernales in, in Ulm. And if you um, want to check it out, it's on the archive today. So, um, just in time. Um, okay. So, um, as you see, the title is pretty ambitious. Uh, let's try to see what, what this actually means. Um, okay, so the basic question that we start with is a question that was asked already by Feynman back in 1957. There's a wonderful um, transcript of, the, of this conference in Chapel Hill, it's a famous one. Um, so, basically, the, the question is what happens to a, to, a, to, a ma to a mass if you place it in a spatial superposition, okay? So, what happens to the gravitational field it generates, in particular? Okay, so this is kind of the experiment. You have a mass, and then you, with, with some, some apparatus, say a stern gerlach apparatus, you can place it in a superposition of, you know, being up or being down. And what happens to the gravitational field? Does it enter a superposition together with the mass, or does it not does it do something else? Because if it does, if it does enter a superposition, there, then you can experimentally somehow reveal this, right? Because you can place a test mass over here, and, if, and you can see whether this mass gets entangled with the first one. If it gets entangled, that means that the gravitational field has followed the previous mass in the superposition, okay? Of course, there is also another option that gravity doesn't really do this. It's an intrinsically classical object and doesn't enter superpositions. And so then we don't really know what could happen, but let's say something else. Let's be vague. Um, yeah, people have ideas, but uh, no definite answer. Um, and the problem that we are going we are going to tackle is whether we can discriminate these two alternatives kind of experimentally, okay? Whether we can design a thought experiment um, to discriminate these two. I mean, this is already a thought experiment, right? Um, it's enough to, to, to do this, and then you check whether there is entanglement between this mass and this mass, and if there is, that means that there was some quantum interaction going on. No classical field could have done that. Okay, so the, the system we will consider is um, a general system of, of harmonic oscillators, a one-dimensional um, harmonic oscillator, so mass is attached to springs, nothing fancy, um, they, that interact gravitationally, okay? So this is just a Newtonian Hamiltonian, nothing uh, special, again, and of course, um, just to say it again, we have two hypotheses. The first one is that gravity acts as a unitary evolution. So like standard quantum mechanics, but the Hamiltonian now is the Newtonian Hamiltonian, okay? So this looks like a classical object, but it should be thought of as a quantum operator. And there are strong, re strong reasons to believe that if, um, you know, some quantum theory of gravity um, is true, um, holds, so then um, this should be the kind of the non-relativistic limit. It, that gravity acts as, in, as a Newtonian Hamiltonian, but thought of as a quantum operator. Okay? And then, of course, there is the, the alternative option that gravity is a kind of underlying classical field. Okay, so what happens in this case? That you, you see, like, there are the, this, this quantum systems, in this case, the, the oscillators, and then they interact locally with some underlying classical field. Okay, so and the only thing that can mediate the interaction between these two guys is the, is the classical field. Okay, so the people in, in quantum information theory have a name for this kind of operations. They call them LOCC, Local Operations and Classical Communication. And they have been um, very thoroughly studied in, uh, you know, in entanglement theory, for example. So that's why, I mean, the title is Testing Quantumness Without Entanglement, but it's kind of, uh, we use a lot of, of, the, of tools from entanglement theory. Because it's about LOCCs. Right, so the main question, like if you want to distill a question in like purely information theoretic terms, if you want, is um, given an isometry on a multipartite system, how well can you simulate it um, with LOCCs? Okay. And there are several figures of merit that you can um, come up with for this task, and they are all interesting, but the one um, that we are interested in is takes into account some experimental constraints that you may have. For example, you may not be able to prepare any state that you want of your initial system, but um, let's say that you can only prepare states taken from this ensemble, okay? So you have some ensemble of states that are kind of easy to prepare in, in, in practice. And, you, um, and a good fig figure of merit is how well can an LOCC simulate the unitary U or the isometry U on these states. So you see, so um, this is a, it's an LOCC that attempts to do a simulation. You see it acts on the state psi alpha and it attempts to reproduce the state psi prime alpha, which is, would be given by the unitary evolution, okay? So that's kind of the, the classical fidelity of simulation, if you want, or LOCC fidelity of simulation on this ensemble, of the unitary on this ensemble. So this depends on the ensemble and the unitary. Okay, so the operational interpretation would be something like this, so a scheme like this, so you, you take a, and you, take a, you prepare basically a multipartite quantum system in, in a state taken from this ensemble, and then something happens there that you want to test. 
the gravitational interaction. And then you, you perform a measurement at the end. So, and you see the measurement has just, it's a binary measurement. The first operator is just the, the projected state. Um, sorry, uh, the projected state. Um, so, w w so the state that, that would, you would find if, the, if inside this purple block there would be, uh, you know, like a unitary evolution, the unitary U, so the psi prime alpha. This is kind of the right state if the, the actual evolution is quantum. And then, um, yeah, the rest is, uh, it means that the, something else. So that maybe it's a classical gravity, right? So the, the, our guess is a classical gravity if we find something else. So as you see, if, if inside the purple box there is a unitary evolution, the unitary evolution you expect, so the, the, the Newtonian Hamiltonian, then you get the outcome Q. You see the psi prime alpha with probability one, right? By construction. And if inside the block there is an LOCC, then the probability that kind of the LOCC can trick you into thinking that it's acting as the unitary, it's exactly this one. So you see, this is the probability that the LOCC is tricking you into thinking that um, there's a quantum interaction. And that's exactly our um, classical fidelity of simulation, once you optimize over uh, all LOCC strategies. Okay, so if you, um, if you say this in other words, it means that if you find the frequency of the Q outcomes which is larger than this, this uh, quantity, then you are sure um, that whatever is inside the block is not an LOCC. Okay? And that's enough, that would be enough for us to conclude that you know, gravity cannot act as a um, local classical field that mediates the interaction. Okay, so and the whole point of the, of the, of the work is to, to understand this quantity, okay? Right, so just, just let's, let's make a very simple example. Let's say that you have a known ensemble of states, and then um, you can ask yourself whether Alice and Bob can swap unknown states from this ensemble using LOCCs, right? So the picture will look some, something like this. You take a state yellow from an ensemble, Bob doesn't know it, and same for Alice, red, and then they do an LOCC, and then they, they, find, they find out that the states have been exchanged. Is, the, is this picture uh, kind of credible? Um, not so much if the ensembles are sufficiently structured. For example, if they include non-orthogonal quantum states, because Alice and Bob don't, don't know how, like you know, what states they, they they have, and they cannot measure it without disturbing it. So, so this kind of this kind of swap operations is uh, maybe the easy toy model to understand. I mean, and and the important thing to observe is that there is no entanglement neither at the beginning nor at the end, right? It's it's always a product state, but still the dynamics cannot be implemented via LOCCs. So that's, that's my main point. So that, that's why without entanglement, because there is no entanglement uh, at any point in the process, but still, this doesn't mean that the dynamics is not LOCC, okay? So th th this is the, the, the reason why the title. Okay, so and the, the key kind of um, general tool that we use to, to tackle this problem is this upper bound on the, on the um, classical simulation fidelity, right? So um, let's try to unpack this. So there is a minimum of uh, um, subsets with, which corresponds to cut over the multipartite quantum system. And then um, there is a something that, um, well, it's a, it's a program. It's, it's an SDP once you fix the, the state omega A. Um, it's an SDP, um, uh, sorry, sorry, it's, uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's a linear program once you fix the, sorry, an SDP once you fix omega A. And it depends on just two things. It depends that are encoded in this object, this RAA prime. Um, this is basically a state on system A and a copy of it, so multipartite system A and a copy of it, um, which depends just on the ensemble and on the unitary that you want to simulate. Okay, so, um, and this gamma J that you have to take, um, so this operation that you, you apply on the state is just a partial transpose over the subsystems J. Okay, that's just the action of the partial transpose. Um, right, so, um, this is this theorem is actually very simple to prove, so I will show you the proof. Just uh, seven lines or six lines, something like this. Um, so this is the fidelity of simulation. So the first thing I, I do is I rewrite um, this object um, using introducing the Choi matrix of the channel. Okay, so it's very simple, standard trick. So then I say, um, okay, then I I can take the sum. You see, I can observe that this sum is basically makes the state R A prime appear. And then I do a standard trick in quantum information. So I apply the partial transpose on both R and D. Okay, so that's um, very common. And then now I say, ah, okay, so but this is an LOCC, so that means that the choice state is separable. Therefore, its partial transpose is positive. Okay, so I'm just using the fact that the operation is a PPT operation, not even LOCC. Okay, so that means that I can apply operator inequalities on the first term. That's what I do. I use some feasible solution from the program that I showed you before, kappa and omega a, 
to um, plug to plug in to find an upper bound there. And then uh, the rest is just very simple because I take the partial trace over A prime and that, that kills the channel um, because it's a choice state. So once you take a partial trace over one side, you know, it becomes the identity on the other side and the identity kills the omega A once you take the trace. So um, yeah, zero points for me for this proof, um, but uh, it's fairly simple. Um, but uh, of course, like the point of the work is to apply this tool to some more complicated scenarios uh, where you actually, uh, yeah, computing the upper bound is not that easy. Right, so um, let's go back to our system of mechanical oscillators in which you have this Hamiltonian. Each oscillator is a quantum, um, a quantum harmonic oscillator, so one dimensional, uh, sorry, um, one dimensional, um, yeah, oscillator is, the, the oscillator is physically one dimensional, but the Hilbert space, of course, is infinite dimensional because it's a harmonic oscillator. Um, you know, there are these canonical operators, X and P, on every oscillator, so X, I, and P, J, X, I, and P, I, um, that obey the canonical commutation relations. And so there is a particular class of states that are oftentimes easy to prepare. These are the, called the coherent states. Um, and they're given by basically displaced vacuum states, so displaced ground states of this of this oscillators. Um, right, so it's very natural to consider as, a, as our ensemble, a Gaussian ensemble of coherent states. Okay, this kind of there, as nice as it gets, basically, experimentally. Um, right, so um, another object that is of interest um, is um, a thing called the Ga Gaussian unitaries. So there are two definitions of Gaussian unitaries, if you haven't seen them ever. Um, the first definition is a unitary that acts like this. This is the vector of canonical operators. Remember, so like x, x1, p1, x2, p2, and so on and so forth. Um, and it basically acts by conjugation on that um, by just applying a linear, so basically the, the action of the unitary on the canonical vec on the vector of canonical operators is just a linear combination of the operators, okay? And uh, the matrix that you get there turns out to be a, 2n by 2n real symplectic matrix, whatever that means, doesn't matter, it's a real matrix. There's also a second definition, which is more, maybe more intuitive, which is any unitary that is induced by, um, as a time evolution of a quadratic Hamiltonian. Okay, so what is a quadratic Hamiltonian? This is a quadratic Hamiltonian, something that is quadratic in the field operators, know, in the canonical operators. And um, anything that comes out as the time evolution induced by this Hamiltonian, or products thereof, um, that's a uh, symplectic unitary. And of course, the, the whole point is that, or Gaussian unitary, the whole point is that these two definitions are equivalent. Okay, so I will always write Gaussian unitaries and characterize them with this symplectic matrix S because it's much simpler. Okay, so what's the application of this fact that we just learned about Gaussian unitaries? Well, um, you see, like if the distance between the oscillators is much larger than the oscillation amplitude, which is often the case because the, in the oscillation amplitude there is an H bar, uh, which is very small. Um, so then you can tailor expand the, the, this Newtonian Hamiltonian up to second order. And what you get, you get um, a quadratic Hamiltonian, and that means that the evolution to first approximation, the, the first non-trivial order of the time evolution is a Gaussian unitary. Okay, so that's why we want to compute this upper bound, the classical simulation fidelity, or the upper bound that we, uh, I showed you before, um, for a Gaussian ensemble of coherent states and a Gaussian unitary. Okay, so that's a problem. So I want to, I would like to tell you that this is an experimentally feasible scenario, but this is actually uh, not, not remotely true. So, um, so, so let's say that it's conceivable, okay? So that's the only claim I'm making, that if you look in, in the paper, we actually spend pages and pages trying to um, understand um, how far away this is from current experimental, uh, you know, practice. And um, yeah, there are, there are several challenges, let's put it like that, but uh, it's, it's conceivable in principle, okay? And also other experiments that um, want to test this kind of phenomena, they are also very uh, difficult to realize. I mean, this is kind of, it's, it's a very difficult experiment because uh, in, you enter in a regime where gravity and quantum are somehow both relevant. Um, right, so, and of course, like the main technical contribution of the work is not the theorem that I showed you before, which is quite easy, but it's this one. So the computation of the upper bound um, that I had before for, for a generic symplectic uh, or Gaussian unitary. Okay, so it's a complicated expression, but it's not that complicated because it just depends on this on this eigenvalues of of this matrix that is constructed out of the symplectic um, matrix. Okay, so it's, it's something you can plug in in Mathematica and it uh, kind of works fine. Um, so you just have to compute like two n eigenvalues or, of of a matrix, kind okay, of a two two n by two n matrix. So it's not too complicated. Um, 
I won't show you the proof of this one because it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a bit uh, technical and also a bit boring. But um, so what, what, what comes out of this is that oftentimes, like the symplectic um, unitary that actually gravity turns out to implement up to first order, up to second order, it turns out to be not only symplectic, but also orthogonal. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that it maps coherent states to coherent states. So that means that the state at the end, you remember the psi prime alpha that we were measuring, that's going to be a coherent state. And this means that the measurement is going to be relatively easy. It's, it's not an entangled measurement or anything. Um, and this also means that um, UG doesn't entangle the, co the coherent states that we fed them, that we fed the, the unitary, right? Okay, but nevertheless, as we saw before in the swap um, example, um, the classical simulation fidelity is less than one, okay? So although the, the dynamics never entangles the states that we, we fit it, um, it still it cannot be simulated by LOCCs, right? Okay. Right, so, so this is kind of a, a simple example. So you have two oscillators on a line and you initialize them in a random coherent state. It's just, a, just to summarize, you initialize them in a random um, coherent state and then you let the system evolve and it will implement a gravitational um, you know, dynamics and this will be approximated by a Gaussian unitary. And then you compute the state at the end. This turns out to be um, also a coherent state, although I haven't written it um, that way. And then you measure with the POVM um, at the output, and that can be done since the since it's a coherent state, the psi prime alpha, beta. Um, this can be done with local measurements, okay, on the single oscillator. So that's that's also um, encouraging. And then you basically check the frequency with which you obtain the kind of the quantum outcome, so the psi prime alpha beta. And there are several assumptions that I'm sweeping under the rug here, but uh, let's keep it like that for now. Um, Right, so this, this functions, this upper bound on the classical simulation fidelity, if you want to look at it, it's something like this. For this simple example, um, you see this, this is, uh, there is a time scale that depends on the strength of the gravitational interaction, fine. So for time, time equal to zero, that's going to be one because, you know, gravity does nothing. And so that it takes nothing to simulate it. Um, but then it decays, um, it kind of um, decays linearly or quadratically depending on lambda, on the variance on your, of your ensemble um, for small times. Okay, so it's kind of, and then and then it comes back because in this approximation the dynamic is periodic. It's kind of a beam splitter dynamics. Um, right. So this is the expression. Um, right. Let's skip this. So what have we gained? So in the last couple of minutes, I want to. Um, so there are two type of um, proposals in this, in this, well, there are several types of proposal to, to detect um, this, um, you know, quantumness of gravity in this sense. And the other main one is this entanglement-based proposals, in which, which is basically the, this Feynman thought experiment in which you try to reveal the entanglement between the test mass and the mass that you place in, in a superposition. And, but our proposal is very different because, as I said, there is no entanglement um, anywhere, but somehow it's hidden in, the LOC, in, in this LOCC, or in this, in this unitary that needs entanglement to be implemented. Um, right, so our proposal needs the ability to prepare coherent states with great, great precision. And to, that means also, since the, this, the coherent states are just displaced, displaced vacuum states, displaced ground states, you need to cool down the system to very few phonons. Um, and then you need all sorts of precise control over all, all your, your measurement apparatus and stuff. And then you, you need, um, goes without saying, excellent control over, experiment, over noise. So, for example, like masses, um, random masses popping up at a distance, they generate a gravitational field that is enough to disturb your, your experiment. So, for example, if you, if you have a, an uncontrolled wind blowing at 500 meters, that's, uh, that's it for the day. So, um, but this is, this is common to basically all of these experimental proposals. So that's why people are um, also talking about doing this in space. But, um, yeah. So, but in, instead, what do you need for the entanglement-based proposals? Um, you need to prepare this large spatial superpositions. These are the very challenging things to, to do. Um, and then, okay, you need the, the effective interferometers to manipulate them. Um, but okay, so let, let's see. So let's see. Let's try to compare like the the cooling down with the spatial superpositions. Which one is more difficult? So if you if you look in the literature, the largest um, mass placed in a, in a spatial large spatial superposition, so for which matter wave interferometry has been um, observed, that's a very heavy molecule, um, 10 to the minus 23 kilogram, uh, but still still quite light. Uh, um, but if you if you ask yourself what is the largest mass that has been cooled, the largest harmonic oscillator mass that has been cooled down to a few phonons, well, it's not a few phonons, it's like 11, but okay, fine. Um, 
but um, so it turns out that this this is um, LIGO's suspended Miro, and it's it's kind of a ten kilo oscillator, so it's much more massive. So it, I'm cheating a bit. It's not the the Miro itself is the cent is the difference between the centers of masses centers of mass of the two pairs of mirrors. So, but the effective mass of this oscillator will be ten kilos. Um, the science paper um, two years ago. So I mean, just saying that it's it's sometimes it's much easier to cool down things than to to place them in large spatial superpositions. Okay, that's that's all I'm saying. Right. So just very quick summary to wrap up. Um, we looked at the problem of LOCC simulation um, um, of a unitary on an ensemble of states, and we gave a general upper bound on the maximum fidelity of simulation, and then we apply this. We computed this upper bound for um, the system of 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 oscillators initializing Gauss in a Gaussian ensemble of coherent states. And um, yeah, and so with that, I thank you. Great, thanks. Um, there are questions. I'm going to try and pass the mic to people, and maybe if people can help me by repassing the mic, that would be appreciated. How many phonons does a 10 kilogram mirror have at room temperature? Ah, very, very many. Um, <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but very, very many. So this is an, I mean, this, this, this thing that I'm saying is this is a, requires kind of an exceptional control over the system. Huh? That's super impressive. 11 yeah. is small. Exactly. 11 is small. So that, that's, that's exactly my point. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, great talk. I, I my first thought, and then at the very end, you you mentioned LIGO. My first thought was LIGO as a like an experimental proposal for this, and I almost wondered, like, have you thought about instead of using superposition of masses to instead allow um, for the superposition of like polarized photons and let like a gravity wave do something along the lines of carry out um, the LOCC or something along the lines of that. Um, cool. Is it kind of like reversing the idea of instead of having the masses be acted on by gravity, instead have gravity act on the key, like the super? Yeah, that, okay, yeah. I mean, um, sure. I mean, you have the problem of having a yeah generating the gravitational wave first of all. Oh, yeah. so you have to wait for it, uh, I guess. So um, it'll, it'll take it'll, it'll take a while, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in theory you, you could try to do this. It kind seems of like they're a lot closer to being able to like um, generate gravity waves relatively frequently the, as well, they detect, get... Uh, more than detect. Detect, right, right, right. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, Did but I mean, like, it, it kind of interacts weekly, right? So already, so I don't know. Like, um, but yeah. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Uh, so I... You went a little quick, so my my question might be wrong. But you had this plot where the your upper bound turned back around. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, the so time is probably long enough that your approximate your Gaussian approximation yes. fails. So what what what's it's still an upper bound? Even so I mean, like this is this just a so in practice any reasonable time would be like here. So you will, you will ah, never see, okay. you will never see this come back, right? So okay, okay, like, okay. Like this is what I, yeah, this is what I didn't spend much time, but basically I mean the, the, this whole, this, the time scale is like three days of the whole thing. Ah, so okay, like, okay, okay. yeah, okay, basically forget it. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I, I also love the, the slide on um, ex experiment because I, I, I'm an experimentalist myself. Um, so some of my experiments, we use a uh, single photon Detectors like um, SNSPDs. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what, like, um, how a single phonon detector might be different than an uh, a uh, SNSPD. So I mean, here it's not it's not photons, it's phonons, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, 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 like how how like the construction of the two systems like would be different. So I think like one one way to 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 measure this kind of things is to to couple the so like we we have a proposal for this um, torsion pendula. And and a way to do this is to couple them to to an optical cavity so that you can control the the optics there. So and then do a yeah. Would it be like optomechanics? E well, I mean it's it's a torsion pendula, but then uh, it's coupled to an optical cavity. So yes. Oh okay yeah my my group also does optomechanics yeah. yeah. I guess we can talk after. Yeah 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 thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we have time for one more. And I'm a theorist, I should, I should also add something. Okay, uh, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, it may be a wrong question, but um, uh, according to your experimental uh, proposal, so it seems that the uh, time evolution due to the gravitation seems across the system, but uh, in my opinion, uh, since the coherent state is the microscopic system, but the, macro, the gravity is the macros uh, macroscopic uh, force, so um, the, my question is, uh, don't don't we need to consider the dissipative effect due to the gravitational effect by using such as, um, I don't know about um, master equation techniques and so on? Yeah, so exactly. So like, uh, that's that's exactly like this. This uh, proposals for classical gravity, they go exactly in this direction. So you have some diffusion process that, um, that you know, because like classical gravity has in, to interact with the quantum system, so it's doing some kind of yeah master equation or partial measurement or whatever you want to call it. Um, but exactly, so the, the point of our of our proposal is that we don't want to enter into that. So we are trying to to make an experiment that excludes all of these classical proposals at at once, like without. Um, so that's why this LOCC. I'm not. I don't want to say what gravity does if it's an LOCC. I just want to make an experiment that could falsify this hypothesis altogether. Welcome. Okay, great. So we uh, unfortunately are out of. Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, and then we'll have to come back on the half hour. And after this question, we'll thank Ludovico just to compress everything. I have a quick question. Thanks for the great talk, first of all. So usually calculating upper bounds on LOCC, it's really hard because you have all these infinite rounds of possible communication. So you didn't comment on this. Like yeah, so I mean, because I'm taking a very like a like a shortcut right just saying just saying ppt operations that's uh that's i mean this is a, it's a very crude upper bound if you if you if you want and uh, in principle you could imagine of like refining this very much further that's uh, yeah like, okay. i mean Thanks. it's already hard enough to compute it for this system of interest but yeah in principle yes great thank you ludovico